Perfect. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Do you want to be a brave learner and a brave writer? I know I do. I mean, I don't think I was in school. <laughs> I've only just adopted that later on in life. But you know what? It's never too late. My um, guest today is a brilliant lady. Her name is Julia, Julie Bogart. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's a creator and the award, of the award-winning Innovative Brave Writer Program, teaching, writing, and language arts to thousands of families every single year. Don't know how she does it. She's also got five kids, which she homeschooled herself. She uh, the, She's reached 191 countries globally and has served over 100,000 families. I'm pretty sure that number has since grown. She has a brand new book coming out, which I'm very excited to speak more with her about called Raising Critical Thinkers. I mean, yes. How <laughs> can I say any more about that? <laughs> um, but anyway, welcome so much to Storybox Podcast today, Julie. Thank you, Jay. I'm so excited to chat with you. I'm so excited to have you here and, and unbox more of your Incredible wisdom and advice. I mean, raising critical thinkers. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> if right. And a parent, it's, right? Right. And it feels like it's globally urgent. Like it's not regional. Everybody on the planet seems to realize that this is a crisis moment for thinking. And we yep. all want to know how to do it better. Mm, I, I myself want to know how to do it better. Uh, and we'll definitely touch on that during this conversation. But my very first question for you is a question I love asking all my guests to start off all my conversations. It's, a, it, it's, it's what does success look like for you? So I was getting ahead of myself a little bit there. <laughs> what does success look like for me? I think it's a great question because uh, I am a business owner and I've read the books and I have the consultants and success always is supposed to be associated with a bottom line. But what's fascinating is how little interest I have in those numbers. I think for me, all the work I've ever done has been really missional. It's just related to the things that I care about. I care about the people I love and life's big, big questions. And for me, engagement in both of those in a consistent way feels like a successful life. So I try not to think about uh, success isn't even really a word I use. <laughs> it feels almost like a phantom. Like if you say you're successful, then you're also also pointing out that it's possible to fail. And I actually don't think about living that way. I think about it more as a an opportunity to have just this fantastic human experience. And I want to do it in as many ways and facets as I possibly can. So I guess I'd call that success. I love that answer, especially because you used my last name, Phantom, and you use it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so double points on that <laughs> from me. I want to be your favorite guest. That will prove that I've been successful. <laughs> you, you've, you've just reached the top now, Julie. I mean, the moment a guest strikes my ego and they use my last name, yes, <laughs> 100%. They, they've already reached the top in my books. But you mentioned something very interesting there on, on your interest level of learning more about some of life's biggest questions. What are some of life's biggest questions that you oftentimes think about or try and answer for yourself? Well, of course, existence is probably the foundational one. You know, why are we here? How did we get here? Who is in charge of our being here? And I've answered that question many different ways. You know, I've been, um, committed to a religion at a certain point. I've uh, been involved in politics. I've been really interested in psychotherapy. Like there are many pieces of the way we navigate the world that I have entered into. But I think for me today, the biggest question, it has less to do with like our origin story, which feels to me a little more scientific or spiritual and more to do with the feeling of sustained connection with the people I value. So the big questions I'm navigating right now are what is it like to be uh, in a healthy relationship? How do you navigate pain? What, where does resentment come from? What creates a uh, healthy connection? What stops that healthy connection? And honestly, that was one of the drives to write this book. It wasn't so much that I wanted to write an academic tome on how our brains critically think. I was actually trying to address this big problem, which is there's a crisis at the heart of all of our best relationships that when we don't agree, we can't be close. 
And I found that really frustrating and upsetting. So that is the top question I think I'm dealing with right now that I'm trying to address and even resolve in my own family and friendships. Should we ask these kinds of questions to kids? Is there a certain age limit that we should, I guess, ask them? (laughs) Well, I think our kids ask them. I don't even think we have to seed the imagination. Kids ask Mm -hmm. all the time, you know, where does such and such come from? Or I'm fighting with my brother and he's wrong and it's up to us to help them find their way back to each other. So I think in a way, children are these clarion calls of existential questions. You know, how do we get to outer space? What do you mean it's that far away? Who who started this whole thing? Like those things come from children. And actually the best thing we can do as adults is not answer them. It's to dig deeper with them, to enter into that fascination, curiosity, the not knowing, the willingness to recognize that there are limits to each one of us, we don't all have access to education and experience or even information that can give us a final answer. But we can really sort of suck the marrow out of the question by being more interested in it. I always say fascination over being convinced. That would be a nice way to enter into some of these big conversations. Uh, These kinds of questions that kids ask, have you noticed that they are sort of dwindling ever so finely over the course of these uh, few years or yeah are we losing the kids ability to ask these sort of questions more and more I really think it depends so much on the subjective location and uh, socioeconomics and parents and education levels but what I will say is this They have research that shows that by sixth grade, so that would be like 11, 12 years old in the United States, that most children have discarded the power of their imagination in their learning experience. So they come into the world fresh with curiosity and full access to their imaginations, and it steadily declines during grade school. And one of the theories that I put forth in my book of why that occurs is because we are so oriented to right answer thinking in school. We actually don't cultivate diversity of perspective. We have a test. There's an answer key. The kids who get all the answers correct get a better grade than those who don't. We all have to give tacit agreement that that answer key is right for all people for all time. There's no way to make a case that says, well, you know, when I read the question, I thought about it differently. My family's background or my experiences made me read it differently. And so this answer is logical for me. There's no, there's no recourse. You are just told this isn't true. So I think what I see is that in the school experience, there is a squelching of curiosity because our goal is supposed to be to know what's the correct answer. And you see it on social media as a result. I really believe that social media exploits that sort of multiple choice mentality. There's a feeling of time pressure because you're scrolling. Uh, There's a tiny comment box. There's a thumbs up or thumbs down or a hug or a like button. And all of these are calling on us to declare that one right answer. And we've been trained to believe that when we do and we cite an authority, everyone will agree with us. And I think we're all in just PTSD for the last 30 years, discovering that not everyone has the same answer key. It's really upsetting. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, I grew up, I I was naturally a curious minded kid. I mean, I go up to adults rather than other kids and I'd ask the adults these wild and outrageous questions. Some of those big questions that oftentimes that I've heard kids not ask these days <laughs> and I, I encourage right. them to ask them more and more but it's interesting because over time I sort of stopped asking them out of fear of this question I feel like is stupid uh, oh. and and all these sorts of things but it's only more recently now that I've embraced the weirdness the curiosity there's no such thing as a a, a bad question the only thing is an unanswered question that you haven't asked. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I got that right. <laughs> um, the only stupid question is a question you haven't asked. There you go. That's got it. it. Got it back. Um, but yeah, I think the the fall of a child's curiosity is 
is a shame. How do we how do we help our kids get it back? Yeah, that's really what my whole book is about. So perfect entry to that. One of the activities I recommend in my first book, The Brave Learner, and then I sort of gave it a reprise in this book because it's so powerful, is to value questions, not to answer them. So if you have children anywhere from ages five to 18, maybe two and three as well, you can actually jot down their questions on a post-it note. So a child might say something like, what's a black hole or how far is the moon? Instead of answering it, say, you know, that's a really amazing question and jot it down and stick it on a sliding glass door or the whiteboard or, a, you know, a surface where it will stick. And over the course of several days, just start collecting their questions for them. They might say something like, hey, why did you give Johnny the blue toothbrush when you knew I wanted it? Great question. Let's write that down. And over time, now your kids um, may even contribute their own. If you leave the post-it notes and a little pen out for them, they may start jotting down their own questions, building on the ones that are there. After several days or a week goes by, bring your phone or your iPad or your laptop to the table at dinner and just start peeling them off and conversing. Look some things up, ask follow-up questions, allow them to sit without the answers just letting it roll around in their brains. You could even read them over breakfast each day. Wow, I see there's some new questions. I'm just gonna read them. Oh, that's fascinating. I've wondered that too. We want to allow our kids to wallow in complexity, to know that there is more to think, more to ask, more solutions than meet that first impression. And we can't get there if we're constantly the right answer book for them. We wanna give them that opportunity also to look up and see that there might be multiple perspectives, not just my parents' perspective. Yeah. What constitutes a critical thinker in your opinion? Yeah. A critical thinker is someone who, when evaluating evidence, is simultaneously able to notice their own bias when it kicks into gear. It's a person who has self-awareness not just the skill of deconstructing that guy's stupid argument, right? Like a lot of us think critical thinking is, oh, I'm a great thinker because I know all the people who don't think well. It kind of reminds me of driving, how everyone thinks they're a great driver, but clearly not everyone is. Um, so critical thinking takes this pause. It says, oh, what's my reactivity here? So a good example of this is I'll be on Facebook and some high school friend of mine, you know, I'm 60. So that's like eons ago. So some person whose, you know, perspectives have not been updated in my imagination for the last 30 years will post some political article and I'll immediately react to it. I'll think, oh, well, she's not who I thought she was or, oh, thank goodness she agrees with me. And then I go and I open the article and I immediately am either defensive or thrilled well, this is all just my reactivity. It doesn't say anything true about the article. So one of the questions that I suggest adults ask themselves when they're engaging in conversation, reading an article, attending a lecture, listening to a sermon, is to ask themselves, what do I hope will be true? What do I hope will be true? If we start with that question, we surface our bias instantly. So if you're reading this political article and you've already noticed that you don't like the guy who wrote the article, and then you say to yourself, well, what I hope will be true is that he cites that one fact that I know is wrong so I can prove, right? The second you do that, you aren't critically thinking. Mm -hmm. You're under an illusion that you're being a critical thinker, but you're actually just protecting a position you already hold. So let's flip it around. And if we surface that feeling, what does it look like to think critically about that article? Well, the first question I like to ask is, what did the author have in mind? Mm -hmm. What did they hope I'd get out of their article? What is the social location and environment this person lives in that made them think this way, that made them want to persuade a person like me of this position? I also ask a question like, what is the beautiful world this author imagines will be the result of that thinking. Because even the people that we really disagree with, and we can go ahead and pull up the Nazis, right? Like as our, our trope, um, they were envisioning that if they followed through on this genocide, life would be easier, better for them for some you know, reason that we don't accept, obviously. But what I'm saying is 
if we start there, at least we begin from a place of not just protecting ourselves and understanding what contribution this person's trying to make. Now, you may develop empathy, but you also might just deepen your horror. And both are valid. It's just that we've got to take that pause and not assume that my perspective that I bring to the table is the one that is the yardstick for everything I read. Let me come back to how we can teach more critical thinking points um, in just a moment, but I want to go back a little bit and ask why isn't critical thinking taught in schools these days? Because I mean, I mean, I remember I was in uni for a period of time and I took a critical thinking lecture, but it wasn't really critical thinking. They weren't really teaching us how to be critical thinkers. It was just what like, were they teaching you? how to argue with another person. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. That's really what it was. And I'm, um, and how to pretty much attack another person's beliefs and biases. Wow. It was shocking. And I'm like, and the lecturer did absolutely nothing. He stood up there and encouraged it. He's like, go for it. Like wow. and I'm sitting there, 700 kids in this lecture. And I'm thinking, well, this is not critical thinking. This is, this is wrong. If we think that this is how we should be teaching young people on how to deal with big questions and topics and biases of other people without empathy. It's just like, you're wrong. I'm right. And there's no real logic behind it. So I guess going back to my, my question is what has happened in the school system that we haven't been teaching kids this important, real critical thinking aspect. Because adults aren't good at it either even university professors, there is just a dearth of understanding of what it actually means to be a person with the capacity to dispassionately look at a variety of perspectives. Now, I teach at a local university here um, when I have time, and I have plenty of colleagues there who have absolutely helped me develop even some of the material in my book. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, Mm. but there is a habit that we've curated culturally, that the goal is to have logical arguments about facts. And what we have not added into that equation is how much more powerful our community loyalties and sense of personal identity are, even in the reading of those facts or that information. We as human beings do not like to lose our connection to our people. And so if you are in a religion a certain university, or if you are from a specific profession, you will find yourself attached to sort of the status of being in that group. These are my people. We eat lunch together, or we read each other's papers, or we show up at work, or we celebrate holidays together. And to challenge someone in that group by an out-group perspective, a point of view that is not tolerated in this group will get you kicked out. So we are very reticent to actually let ourselves consider views that put our communities at risk, our membership in those communities at risk. Mm -hmm. And so encouraging people to argue, you're just telling them double down on how much you wanna belong in your community. You're not actually training them to think about thinking. So in that sense, do you believe in debates? Do you think they actually work? I think debates are interesting But I actually don't find that people move off their positions very easily. I mean, this is me just sort of speaking off the top of my head, but here's what I actually think is more powerful. In my book, I talk about how in a lot of the thinking literature I read, they were advocating that people should care more about getting it right Mm. than being right. Okay, so this notion that you should be willing to have your view overturned because here's better information. But I even think that doesn't work. Because the second you say, try to get it right, you do want to be right. And even if you overturn your perspective, now you're just landing on another lily pad of information and you're going to double down on that. I saw this, um, I'll I'll, I'll share this as a side note. I saw this in communities of ex-religious people. So Mm -hmm. while they were really attached to their religion, they believed in the authority of their scriptures. They believed in the authority of their clerics. They believed in the authority of their community leaders. 
once they start deconstructing that, however they do with science or, you know, emotional abuse or whatever, embezzlement, whatever leads them to question that, a lot of them leave and become secular atheists and they behave in the exact same way. They attach to scientists whose credibility they just adopt because they're well-known, not because they have the credentials to evaluate their work. Uh, They adopt the secular narrative of the atheist as theirs and theirs alone. There's this like swinging from one branch of full trust to the other, and you still haven't really had critical thinking. Critical thinking asks a different set of questions. It says, what's at stake? What what is the issue that's at stake? So if we're talking about religion, perhaps it's the afterlife. So we're asking a big question here. And the people who believe in religion are trying to answer it in a way that saves you. But the people who don't are as well. They're saying you don't have to worry about it because there's nothing there. And that provides an emotional release for a lot of people. So when we really drill down, Critical thinking then is the capacity to hold multiple views simultaneously, dispassionately. And your only job isn't to get it right. It's just to get it. (laughs) Can you just get it? Can you get why they're animated? Can you get how they built their perspective? Can you get why this data is meaningful to them and this data isn't? Mm. If you can do that for multiple points of view around one issue, the amount of understanding you will gain And your relationship to that topic will completely be altered. It will be altered. doesn't mean you're changing positions. It just means you appreciate all the complexity at a different level. I think that just sort of explained how your bias and understanding shapes thinking in general. That's right. Yeah. I like that because I had a conversation with someone not that long ago. uh, And this is a passionate individual and very opinionated about certain things. And they were questioning me about my belief in God and my faith. And I just knew that I'm not going to convince this person. Otherwise it's just not worth really my time, but you know what? I'll give the benefit of the doubt. (laughs) I'll do my best. Uh, But it just seemed like at the end of the day, it was this, constant bombardment of this is factual information dismissing my belief and my bias whereas I understood where this person was coming from but he didn't understand where I was coming from to the full extent which I don't believe was critical thinking happening at all because <laughs> it was yeah it's just one sided argument which I don't think is is good at at all but I thought I'd I'd just share that anyway Well, no, let me just comment on that for a minute, because it's such a great example. So if this person wanted to know more about you, he could have asked you, in what ways does your faith create a beautiful life for you? In what ways is this valuable to you? In what ways does this serve the goals you have to be a good person of intelligence and um, practicality, as well as someone with a deep spirituality? You, on the flip side, could ask that same question of him, but in his arena. How is it that science paints a beautiful picture of how we understand the universe? How is it that your relationship to religion um, is a superior experience of being human for you? We spend too much time thinking about converting people to our views We're like little missionaries out there trying to get everybody to be on team right ideas. And they're always my ideas instead of actually benefiting from someone else's idea. So do you have time for a story? I have a good story for you. Please. So I have I have been a missionary. I lived in uh, North Africa when I was young uh, in my 20s. And obviously my mission was to convert Muslims to Christianity. So that's a pretty explicit. Mm. You're wrong. I'm right. Kind of mission. That would and have been while hard. I was, yes, yes, because amazingly, people are attached to their culture and their religions, right? But you know, I was young, I was ambitious, and I remember living there with my husband, and our little apartment was across the street from a mosque. So five times a day, the Musain would sing the call to prayer. And it's quite pretty if you've ever heard it, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and it would punctuate my day five times a day. I wasn't a Muslim, but this call to prayer would come along in early in the morning, mid morning, lunch, late afternoon and dusk. And uh, one day I was in the kitchen, I was washing vegetables and bleach. And all of a sudden the call to prayer came on and I got emotional. And I thought, gosh, what an amazing tradition that this other religion gives you an actual audible, like they're over there, like, Hey, don't forget to check in with your spiritual self. Don't forget that while you do mundane tasks, something else is also happening in you. And at the end of the day, my husband got home and I said, honey, if we convert these people, can we keep the call to prayer? Like I had this moment where what happened for me is I actually got why it was valuable to them. It didn't have anything to do with who was right, who was wrong. I was suddenly moved by what this actually did for people. Okay, so let's fast forward now to 2022. In November, I was flying home from California. I had just had um, a family crisis. So I had to take the red eye back to my home and I was emotional and crying the whole way home. And when I got back, it was five in the morning. So I didn't want to ask anyone to pick me up at the airport. So I got in the taxi line and my taxi driver was outside the taxi. He opened the door. I got in and I look in the rearview mirror and he's standing outside the taxi with a bottle of water, pours it on his hands, dumps it on his head, puts it in his mouth, washes it out with his finger. And all of a sudden I went, he's getting ready to pray. It's that time of morning. And he got in the car and he prayed the prayers the whole way home. And all I could feel was comforted because it tapped me back into that experience, that memory. And the reason that I want to share that is because so often critical thinking transcends logic. It has to do with actually getting inside the lived experience of other human beings. Mm -hmm. You know, we get horrified by getting the inside, the getting to the inside of a person who's a murderer, not saying it will always lead to empathy, but it will more often than we allow ourselves right now. And by opening that door, we're actually seeing the richness of humanity and can even be contributed to. It's not just a zero sum match over whose religion is the right one in that moment. Mm. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it. And going back to sort of that story with, with me, you're right. I mean, I ended up just asking him, I was just like, so what is it to you that I have this faith? Is it hurting you at all? Is it disrupting your day? And then he ended up saying to me, I just don't want you to miss out on anything. And I'm like, but I haven't. And I don't see life with my faith in God as missing out. I see it as a total opposite. And nowadays, like I, I gave up, you know, I grew up in a conservative Christian household, you know, the the preaching, it's just we right. go out and evangelize and you convert, convert, convert. And I'm like, it doesn't it doesn't work that way because then I realized what you were saying, people are quite comfortable in that. So I just like, it's not my job to do that. It's my job to love, to be respectful, to use critical thinking in a way that is empathetic to others, to understand their line of thought. And like what I did with, with this person, I understand science. I respect science. I respect these people that had these I, great ideas and you name it, whatever it is, because if that's his belief, so be it. If he can see that I've got my faith and how it works for me, then maybe he might understand it a little bit more, but because he hasn't had that, his own experiences with it, if he doesn't have the the facts in front of him. It's just removing faith out of the equation and understanding and, and so be it. So yeah, it's a very interesting topic actually. <laughs> Do I no, love it, it is. It, it totally is because part of what we're bumping into has less to do with the content of either person's beliefs and more to do with what makes us feel secure in the world. So mm-hmm. for a person who is, you know, sort of anti-science or anti-faith, and I, I'm from the homeschooling space, so believe me, I've been in the middle of those polarities more times than I can count. There's something about ensuring your place 
is meaningful in the world that animates those que- those discussions. There isn't very much trust. In fact, there's an absence of trust. There's no ability to trust that that person also has cognitive powers, personal experiences, identity, cultural heritage, access to learning, access to tradition, mm-hmm. um, can become educated. There's sort of this understanding that I have arrived in a place that is so true and convincing. It's my job to ensure that other people come to where I am. But as you are pointing out, you know, I've lived abroad multiple times. And even when you're not a missionary, just adopting other customs, learning the language, understanding how to shop, you know, how to catch a taxi. These are completely different worldviews that work for people. And our job, I always say, isn't, um, isn't to decide whether or not it's right. Uh, it's actually to build tolerance. Now, in my book, I talk about tolerance in a slightly different way. Most of the time when I've heard people talk about tolerance, they're usually a little more on the political liberal side, and they're they're talking about tolerating that person over there that they don't agree with or they find offensive. But for me, tolerance is actually not that. It's not a beatific attitude where you, you know, put up with somebody you don't agree with. Tolerance means learning to tolerate your discomfort. Oh, that's good. It's your discomfort. Like when I'm with this person and I really disagree with them and it's making me anxious, it's to turn that, you know, camera around, take an academic selfie and look at myself and say, well, why is that happening in me? Why do I want to shout them down? Why am I agitated? Why am I annoyed? Oh, I'm going to tolerate that and learn something additional. I'm going to be curious Or, you know, if the person's just a bully, I'm going to remove myself. But it's learning to tolerate your own discomfort. So to piggyback then on family, if you've got children and they come to you and they tell you who they are from their perspective Mm -hmm. and it doesn't align with your family's values, your job is not to change their minds. It's to tolerate the panic welling up in you so that you preserve the connection with your child and you go on that journey with them. That is critical thinking posture. That's brilliant. (laughs) Oh, this is so good. What if you come across some misinformation from either a family member or Mm. if it's online as well and you just want to have let loose, is it still the idea of tolerating in the way you described it? I think that there is a mixture here. So if you think it's misinformation and they don't, that's hard, right? And now you're going down a path where you're just going to lock heads. So at that point, you can make comments like, you know, when I read about XYZ, uh, the authorities I trust said this, which is in contradiction to yours. So that's interesting that that's the information you have. This is the information I have. So it's sort of recognizing that they're coming from a different authority source, but sometimes you're just wrong. And I'm going to tell you the story that's in the book because my boyfriend and I were laughing about it last night. So um, a while back, and this is perfect because Australian podcast here, a while back, I was uh, reporting to my boyfriend, we're both big sports fans, that Naomi Osaka had just served 193 mile per hour serve and it was the fastest on record. And my boyfriend, who's a huge sports fan, just started laughing. He said, Julie, that's not even possible. And I was annoyed because he's really good at facts. And so I actually put up my hand. I said, stop it. I know this is true. I read it. I am absolutely convinced. And I'm tired of you just denying my facts right away. So he got kind of quiet because I got so pushy. He goes, but Julie, like the fastest serves men serve are like 130, 140. And then I got nervous. And I was like, well, how do you, how do you know that? And he's like, because I follow tennis. I know. I said, well, I'm going to show you. And I start scrolling through Instagram, looking for the post where it is. And he says, what tournament was she playing in? I said, the Australian Open. And he goes, Julie, could that have been kilometers per hour? And sure enough, as I get to the screen, there it is, 193 KPH. I'm just passing along misinformation completely, Right. And he was sweet about it because, you know, he loves me. But the the point is, you can challenge a person's facts, but you have to go look it up. 
And you want to ask like benchmarks and just to say someone's wrong does nothing. So if somebody really does have misinformation, chase it down, do it respectfully. Sometimes it's helpful to send it by text the next day. Don't do it in person while you're arguing, right? Give them time to consider and always couch it in. Well, this is what I know to give people time to save face. Because the hardest thing is to be wrong. I mean, when he was right and I was wrong, I was like, ah, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to be right. I wanted to be right. Yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone really wants to be the, the embarrassed one in that scenario. I got my my facts mixed up and I do it all the time. I just. Oh, same. I'm not good with numbers. Nowadays, in my stride. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I always tell people if I cite a statistic, it's an adjective. You can't really count on it to be accurate. It's just to tell you to be impressed that it was huge or tiny. Like that's pretty much my statistical awareness. But then that means if that's actually true about me and I know that, then when I do go to cite a statistic, I probably should double check. I probably shouldn't just pop off in a conversation and think that I remember accurately. And that's the kind of stuff that we really want people to think about when we're raising children. We mm. want to train them in habits of reconsidering, double checking, vetting the information, knowing the benchmarks of that field before you read about those statistics so you get them right. Um, and then also creating room to be wrong, to change your mind and not have it be a shameful experience in your family. Don't make fun of people who misquote a statistic, mm. right? help them, support them, treat it as something absolutely normal that we all do and that it's perfectly honorable to regroup and now align with the new information. That would be an amazing gift if we would do that in our families. It would be because I'm helping them be more critical thinkers and I'm encouraging them at the same time to do their own research and not right. just to take my word for it. And based That's on right. the, the whole trusting, I mean, Sure, I'm not going to go out of my way to lie. I mean, that's a different story altogether. If I, but I've made a genuine mistake, then yeah, forgiveness is is key and crucial there. But I remember as a kid, I had this massive fascination with stories and events that transpired. I would sort of make them heightened than what they actually were. And mm. my poor mum, she had to become good at telling or asking me, she, she was probably the best critical thinker of the whole lot of us because she had to put up with my stories. <laughs> but yeah, she would ask these questions like to dive a little bit deeper into the truth of actual what was going on. So this is a different to, you know, misinformation and facts, right? So I was actually telling a, a story to make it sound better than what it really happened. But yeah, she, she encouraged uh, me to always tell the truth. Uh, but she, if we, we did get something wrong, then we'd make a joke of it. Right. We just laugh it off. But yeah, I thought I'd share that. <laughs> uh, no, I like <laughs> that. I, I like that your mom was creating a space for you to reconsider or to recalibrate what you express so that you could experience what it's like to rethink. I think a lot of us we really like to camp on our opinions and it feels unsafe to reevaluate. We lose face. We might lose community. I, I was one time re doing research on a website that I knew my spouse didn't think had good information. And I was so nervous about him finding out. I did it in the middle of the night. I cleared my browser history after I was done. I was shaking so hard while I was typing on the keyboard that I almost couldn't type the website when you live in that kind of situation where you aren't free to actually follow the rabbit trail of your own thinking. And of course, you know, eventually he found out and, and apologized that I felt that way, but I had built up in my imagination that that was what his reaction would be, which was conditioned by the entire community that I was a part of. When you create those conditions, you're actually creating neuroses on the part of the person doing the thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unfair to them. We never want to do that to our children. Mm -hmm. There is no question or thought you can have that is unworthy of your pursuit if it matters to you. Mm -hmm. And yes, it can be painful when you face something that suddenly challenges a core idea or belief, but you can do it privately. 
This is something we've lost in this very social media, honor, uh, online, internet, world wide web moment. You don't have to reveal all your thoughts. And you certainly don't have to comment on everybody else's. It is okay to be uncomfortable for a period of years while you withhold your opinion and you allow multiple ideas to sit inside you privately mm. while you mull them over. That's probably one of the best things you can do to be a better thinker. If this interests you at all, go and get a copy of a book. I can highly recommend it. So if this is, if you're enjoying this conversation, I can highly say that the book will be so much better than me talking. <laughs> but just listen to Julie, okay? Um, but why did you decide to write this book in the first place? What was the the genesis for you? The internet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, not kidding. I was in my late 30s when the World Wide Web first came online. And uh, I expected, I was a homeschooler at the time, I expected that my community of homeschoolers, which were mostly married, religious, white, stay-at-home moms, that we would all help each other and support each other beautifully. And we did. There was a lot of that that happened. But there were also big arguments over paper versus cloth diapers, bottle and breastfeeding, whether or not to let a baby cry at night, let alone the bloodbaths over theology and politics that I never saw coming. And I became stunned. I was like, we would never do this at a park day. This would never happen at a Bible study. Why is everyone so willing to go to this attack mode when they're behind a keyboard faceless? And I have been fascinated with that for 30 years. I went to grad school. I even have spent so much time online doing deep dives into the sort of psychological profiles of people who troll and why they feel so aligned with their perspectives and then lose their manners at the same time. So this has really been a long study and I feel like the book is the fruit of all that thinking and research. What did you find about out about trolls and why people are trolls? So I, the, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn cause I didn't um, I'm not a psychologist, but the personality that is driven to create chaos is usually a psychological profile of a person with a lot of emotional damage in their lives. Yeah. And so that the way that they create a sense of connection is through disconnection, right? So they stir up trouble and now everyone's responding to them. So suddenly they're visible and they show up. And that's sort of like the black sheep in the family, right? It's the person who uses creating trouble to feel valuable in that space. So mm -hmm. when you see a troll, the best way to disarm them is to give them a different kind of attention, positive attention as opposed to negative and antagonism, you know, and doesn't always work. Sometimes the best thing is don't feed the trolls, just block them. But occasionally I will ask a question back to them and that seems to disarm. Instead of responding to their question, respond, this can work in your family too. So you've got someone attacking you and you feel threatened. You can, you can respond to them like, well, tell me more about that. Like, I'm curious to know even more. <laughs> Give me more of your powerful statements because they're expecting antagonism. They get a lot of energy from that. Mm. I just say, thank you. <laughs> thank you thank is you, great. Smiley face. <laughs> Thank you is great. Thank you for participating. Glad you're here. Now, if they keep going, and a lot of them do, I, I think it's perfectly appropriate to block them because for a person who is not self-aware, they will not be transformed by your gentleness and your kindness. Yeah. But some people are sort of borderline, right? They're just like very zealous. So until you know for sure that they're just going to double down on being disruptive, I kind of give people room. I always say this. I don't mind passion. I do. I do mind bullying. Yeah. So I draw the line at bullying. But, you know, to state your case with a lot of force, that doesn't bother me as much. Mm. Having gone down the massive rabbit hole of the Internet and learning so much, uh, I can only imagine what they would have done for your own mental health. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but what were some of the challenges that you faced when writing a book like this? Well, um, one of the things that happened is that I had to overturn a preconception that I brought with me when I was getting ready to write. 
I'm such a fan of technology and the internet. I'm definitely a Herman Kahn technological optimist. I believe all the problems technology creates, technology will solve. <laughs> That's kind of the maxim I live by. But um, so as a result, I've been a very big defender of reading online and using Kindles and um, that you don't have to read full books to be a well-educated person. And interestingly, this one book I read by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, really overturned that presupposition for me. He sustains an argument that says, at the advent of the printing press and educating people to learn to read and write, we created a completely new track in our brains called Deep Focus Attention States, mm -hmm. meaning we were no longer threatened by the grunt of a warthog. We were no longer worried about people breaching the walls to our home. We could go sit in a library or a monastery and read mm -hmm. like crazy idea. And as a result, for the last 1500 years or so, we've been training ourselves to drop into a deep state of attention. And here's what the features of that deep state are. Fascination, the ability to hold multiple views, to make interconnections between different disciplines, the capacity to revise your own beliefs. This is what we've gained from reading over these 1500 years. But along comes the internet on your phone, and suddenly the hyper vigilant focus attention state of our primary primal ancestors is back with a vengeance and instead of it being you know an attack or a warthog it's a ping it's a jingle it's a red dot notification and we're right. just so worried yeah we're worried we're going to miss something and so what's happening is we're training our brains away from the deep attention states because the places that used to be quiet where we read have now been invaded. The walls are breached mm -hmm. and we have to prepare for this person who's coming across the walls. So what they've discovered, and this blows my mind, you literally have to turn your phone off and put it in a room where you can't see it and then read for about 20 minutes silently to get back to that state. Mm -hmm. And we've got to treat it the same way we treat exercising in an age of cars. Right. So cars came along. We're not walking anymore. Well, now we have to build in exercise to make up for that. And that's true now with deep focus attention states and deep reading. Yeah. So I actually started a reading practice that was a lot more consistent again once I did that research, because even though I know how to do it, I realized I really wasn't doing it as often as I thought. And I was easily distracted by my phone. Have you read or heard of Johan Hari? And I have Stolen, not. Stolen Focus. I mean, I absorbed this book like there was no tomorrow, but it, he talks about exactly what you were just talking it. about. And he was saying that it takes uh, some, somewhere around 23 minutes after we've been distracted to get refocused into the tasks yes. that we were doing before. And he's like, we, we live in a world where there's so many different distractions all around us the phone just being one of them. And right. you've also got emails, you've got different browsers that are open. And so we're constantly like thinking about a different task that needs to be done all at the same time. And we're not truly ever focused on really one particular task for more than a few minutes or whatever it is, because our attention and our focus is being stolen from us. And the the hor horrifying thing was, we were talking yesterday actually about our kids and our kids' creativity is being stolen from them. So the vast majority of kids these days, because of the, the teachings and technology and all that sort of stuff that's going on, and there's many other uh, aspects to why our attention is being stolen from us that he does dive into. But yeah, it was just a crazy, crazy thing about it's horrifying really that our kids, and I mean, I always say this, if you want to change a generation, educate the kids. So, yeah. or don't educate the kids pretty much. So we're educating the kids the wrong way. I think we just need to fix them. And that's why I love your, your research and, and what you were just talking about a second ago, just reminded me of 
Johans, yeah. I highly, highly recommend this book. Honestly, it's so yeah. Good. No, it's so important. And honestly, one of the things that I find challenging is trying to go against the current zeitgeist. Right? Like I, it, shaming and blaming people never fixes problems. Mm. So we want to show people what the value is of sustained attention or imagination or creativity, the same way that most people are not going to turn themselves into runners until they understand, well, actually, you know, I was a marathoner and those, I didn't imagine that I could ever do it. I was just a like garden variety runner. And one of my friends said, oh, let's do this. And it sounded like such a big hurdle. But as I got into the running community, as I trained my body, the benefits made me get out of a cold bed in January and put on a hat and go running in the snow, right? Like then you couldn't stop me. I had to have it to feel good about myself. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. We want to always give our, our people a reason to pursue the thing that's hard, not just blame them for choosing the thing that's easy. Yeah. Julie, I am mindful of your time. Um, I know you. we've gone a little bit over. <laughs> I apologize about that, but I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Could speak to you for ages on on this topic, but where do you want people to connect with you and, and get a copy of your new book before I ask you the final question? Great. Um, so I am active on Instagram. So if you want to follow me there, Julie Brave Writer, W-R-I-T-E-R, -E that's my account. Uh, you can get the book at Book Depository. It's great if you're in Australia. Go to RaisingCriticalThinkers.com for a free downloadable book club guide if you want to read it with your friends. And then if you've got children or teens who need support in writing, please visit my website, BraveWriter.com. I'll make sure everyone knows where to find you and get a copy of this book. I highly, highly recommend that you do. Uh, Julie, this is my all-time favorite question. I love asking this question at the end. It's a hypothetical one, but it, I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Mm. Um, I think I wanted to say that I was willing to reconsider. <laughs> I honestly think that is the theme of my life. I like generating insight and I'm always up for reconsidering what I know. The perfect send off message. Julie, thank you so much once again for your time today, your wisdom, your advice and everything that you are putting out there into the world. It's extremely helpful. Really enjoyed this conversation with you today, but thank you so much for joining me on the Storybox podcast. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation too.